Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to March edition of Estian's RIG webinar series. Today's presentation will be covering trends in the global voting RIG market and highlighting some of the key regions to help you navigate this tightening segment. Today's presenters are Cinnamon Edron, head of our Estian RIG market research here in Houston. And she'll be joined with Matthew Donovan, our senior rig analyst, also based here in Houston. Before we start the presentation, just a couple of housekeeping notes. The presentation will, take, will last about 30 minutes and we will include some time for questions and answers at the end of the session. To ask a question, please use the Q&A box on the right side panel of the event window. Today's presentation is being recorded and we'll post that onto an Estian website later this week. I'd now like to invite Cinnamon and Matthew to start the presentation. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Today's webinar theme was inspired by the Tetris video game, in which the player tries to slot various shaped blocks into available positions before the screen fills up. It roughly describes our market conversations over the past few months. With limited floating rig availability, which rig will get the job? And what does that mean for other open jobs when that rig is booked and no longer available? It's a familiar disclaimer we're all aware of. Today, Matthew and I will give a market overview, provide some regional analysis, highlighting some of the market trends we're seeing in the, in the floating rig market. Begin with the market overview. Starting out broadly, as we noted in our previous webinar, the market is now in a multi-year super cycle. We've seen increased seismic bookings around the world. GS, TGS, and CGG all announced various financial high points in their recent earnings reports. GS has recently secured a new 3D contract for Namibia. CGG has reported a 3D re-imaging project in the exciting Bozo do Amazonas area off Brazil. And Shearwater Geoservices announced two 40 seismic contracts with Petrobras off Brazil. Looking at CapEx budgets, we're also seeing increases there, not just for this year versus last year, but also for operators' multi year plans. A few examples are listed on this slide. Service providers such as SLB, formerly known as Lumberjay, are reporting expectations of growth in Latin America and a spending uplift in the U.S. Gulf. Turning to the earnings reports from EMPs, these are also showing strong returns. In addition to the ones listed on this slide, ExxonMobil reported full-year 2022 earnings from its upstream segment of $36.5 billion, which is up by $20.7 billion from 2021. All of these factors are helping to drive the offshore rig market. On the right, you can see the trend of the under construction, cold, and warm stacked floaters decreasing, while the number of rigs being reactivated for upcoming assignments has pushed up the repair SPS category, and the drilling count is also up. Let's take a closer look at supply. On the left, you'll see additions to the market through deliveries in the dark blue, reductions from the market through conversions outside of drilling, and also recycling in the light blue. It's easy to spot that far more rigs have left the global fleet than have been added in recent years. The numbers, since 2018, there has been a 37% reduction in the semi-sub supply and a 29% reduction in the drill ship supply. The total floater supply, not counting rigs that have not yet been delivered, stands at 189. There are another 20 yet to be delivered, which Matthew will soon talk more about. Final item of note on this slide was that during the downturn, quite a few young rigs were retired. The market lost 22 semi subs and 19 drill ships that were built in the 2000s. Hindsight being 2020, we can see that if we had even some of these units still available today, and current market dynamics wouldn't be nearly so tight. Let me take a more detailed look at availability for competitive rigs. This slide and the next. The purple represents firm commitments, while the pink are the unexercised options. Green is warm stacked, and orange is for repair, maintenance, and reactivations. The seventh gen chart on the left shows a few gray bars, which represent those units still under construction that are being marketed. 
For a while now, we've been hearing about how tight the 7th gen drill ship market is, and you can see how little space is available on the chart on the left, not only for this year, but also for next year. While there are quite a few options showing for 2024, many of these are pre-priced and tied to older, lower rates, which increases the likelihood of them being exercised. Much has been made of the tight 7th gen segment. 6th gen segment has quietly gotten tighter as well, as you can see on the right. For operators unable to secure a 7th gen drill ship, finding an available 6th gen drill ship may not be easy either. It's also worth noting, some of what appears to be available on this slide might no longer be available, as some of these rigs have either been signed up recently and not yet announced, or contracts are under negotiation and expected to be finalized soon. Another trend is the return of options at market rates. If rig contractors are including options on new charters, they are now either at escalated rates from the primary term or they are to be negotiated based on market rates. For those thinking they can turn to the 6th gen semi-subs for their campaigns, here's a look at how that market is showing some signs of tightening as well, with B9 or international units on the left and harsh environment units on the right. 6th gen semi-subs are currently more available than the 7th or 6th gen drill ship segments, but as mentioned on the previous slide, some of these units are understood to have been recently secured or are near to being secured. For the harsh environment market on the right, Matthew will talk more about it coming up, but for now, I'll just note that we are expecting additional work to come out of Norway next year related to the development incentives, which will help fill some of these available slots. Focusing on fixture trends in contract signings, we are seeing that durations are picking up. So far this year, 25 rig years have been booked versus 15 rig years over the same period last year. In terms of contract lengths, by this time last year, there were three contracts with terms of at least one year, with the longest being for about a year and a half. Fast forward to this year, we've already booked seven charters with terms ranging from one to three years. Where's most of the work coming from? That would be the Golden Triangle, which is South America, primarily Brazil, the U.S. Gulf, and West Africa. 93% of drill ship time booked this year, 62% of semi-sub time, has been for work in the Golden Triangle. The pie charts on the right show that the Latin America markets have dominated fixtures so far this year. Finally, when broken down by rig managers, the three with the most time fixed so far this year Transocean with six rig gears, Valerius with four and a half, and Stena with three. One topic of interest related to bringing in supply to ease the tightness we've been discussing is through reactivations of stacked rigs. Most rig contractors have been fairly cautious about introducing capacity into the market. Not only do they want to avoid flooding the market with availability, which would then place downward pressure on day rates and possibly push other rigs into idleness, but also global conditions related to supply chain challenges, increased labor and parts costs, and decreased shipyard slots for oil and gas projects have resulted in reactivations now taking much longer and costing much more than they did even just a year ago. Since the beginning of 2022, 12 reactivations have been completed, including some that finished earlier this year. Currently, five drill ships and two semi-sub reactivations are either underway or preparing to commence. Listed on the right for you, along with their design category and target operational start. Note, all seven are planning to start work this year. In general, rig contractors have limited reactivations without a firm contract in place. Aquarius has undergone some reactivation activities, even though it does not yet have a firm contract. Once a contract is secured though, we expect the pace of this reactivation will pick up based on the target delivery date to the operator. For the most part, contractors have been stating that before they will commit to a reactivation, they need to see that they will be able to recoup the reactivation costs over the initial contract term. It could be done in a variety of ways, potentially through some combination of mobilization fees, the day rates associated with the term charter, and even upfront payments in some cases. Reactivations of cold stack drill ships that have not yet started we're expecting this will now take about 12 to 18 months at a cost of around 75 to 100 million, which in turn means that the stakes are higher to secure in a longer term 
and or higher day rate will be needed than just a year ago. When reactivation from cold stack could be done in about nine months at a cost of about 45 to 60 million. Over to Matthew. Thank you, Cinnamon. Turning now to new build floating rigs, which will be able to fill some of the gaps in the market, but supply is limited for those. We currently have 20 new build floating rigs remaining worldwide. Half of these units are owned by shipyards, but I should point out that out of that 20, only nine units are seventh generation drill ships. And all of these rigs were ordered prior to 2014, and most we can expect to be delivered within the next one to three years. However, some of the drill ships below seventh generation level or some of the non-harsh environment semi submersibles may not be completed as drilling rigs. And it should be important to note that we are not seeing drilling contractors and investors yet begin to order new rigs at this point in the cycle. Contractors are more focused on their current floating rig fleets, reactivations, or the readily available rigs rather than ordering new units. In addition to that, shipyard capacity has been reduced and non-rig projects are keeping yards occupied. Any new rig orders would require a lengthy design phase for uh, accounting for modern drilling and emission efficiencies, and the supply chain for new rig construction will need time to restart. So even if a rig was ordered today, a uh, new floating rig could take four to five years to deliver and would not be an answer to the current uh, tightness in supply. Moving on now to the seventh generation drill ships still remaining that have attracted a great deal of attention from the market. Now, none of those current new build rigs are known to have drilling contracts in place at this time, but we are aware that there have been advanced discussions for several of them. The seventh generation, new, generation new, ships, new builds still owned by shipyards have all been the subject of interest from drilling contractors seeking to expand their fleet quickly. And over the past six months or so, we've seen some of these rigs be bought, including the Deepwater Aquila, which was purchased in November by a Transocean linked venture, and the West Dorado, which was bought an investment by an investment group in January of this year. Uh, remaining 7th gen drill ships still owned by shipyards including the Zonda, Draco, Libra and the KFELS can do are likely to be bought or bare boat chartered from the shipyards over the next two years. Turning now to day rates. So as we explained, we're in a situation with high demand and a limited supply of these floating rigs. And so we're expecting average day rates to rise over the next two years. Uh, as you can see on the chart here, the uh, previous day rates, day rates for drill ships previously rose through 2021 into this year, and we're expecting that to continue. Uh, leading edge day rates for seventh generation drill ships are now in the 400,000s, and we're expecting that to continue to trend upwards. And what we'll see now is the semi-submersible day rates will likely follow the drill ship market and increase over the next two years. Moving on now to regional analysis, where we'll be taking a look at some of the specific regions that are of interest to the floating rig market. Over to Cinnamon. Thanks, Matthew. We'll start the regional section with South America, the major hotspot for floating rigs at the moment. On the right is a map with open floating rig requirements for this year and next year by country and time in rig years. Brazil has the most by far and this is not even counting the tenders we understand are still planned to come out of later this year. Some of this demand will be filled with rigs already in the region. There are opportunities for some incremental units to be added. To keep this growth in perspective, Brazil peaked at over 80 rigs working in 2012. During the downturn, Brazil's rig count dropped to 12 by late 2019. It has since rebounded to 24 and more growth is expected. Clear, we are not expecting Brazil will return to 80 working rigs, but moving towards 40 in the coming years might be more realistic. I also want to point out that while in the past, Brazil's offshore was pretty much synonymous with Petrobras, a number of other operators are also active in the country's offshore sector. We are currently tracking open rig requirements for this year and next year for nine operators other than Petrobras. Meanwhile, the Guyana Suriname Basin continues to grow. ExxonMobil remains the most active operator in the area. 
but recent discoveries have also been confirmed by Total Energies, APA, Shell, and CGX Energy. In total, 14 discoveries were announced in Guyana and Suriname's floater sector last year. Besides these countries, Colombia is emerging as a natural gas market. Two discoveries were announced last year, both of which are likely to be fast-tracked, hence the 1.5 year rig years of work on the map chart. As the last point on this slide, several of the countries with active offshore drilling have had recent changes in their governments that may lead to some strategic changes in their respective administration's energy strategy. In some cases, new oil and gas regulations are being considered, but renewable energy strategies are being developed as well. Moving to the Gulf of Mexico, here we have a Mexico sector on the top and the U.S. Gulf sector on the bottom. Starting with Mexico, the deep water sector remains mostly in the exploration phase. There are two developments that are progressing towards po possible final investment decisions or FIDs later this year, and those are the Zama and Trion projects. On the table on the right, you see the region's fairly small semi-sub fleet. Only two of these rigs are currently working. Notably, two of the stacked units were purchased last year by another domestic contractor. One of these rigs, the La Maria 4, is currently in the Bahamas, but we expect both La Maria 4 and the Centenario to return to the active market. Also of note is that we expect New Fortress will mark its entrance as an operator when it commences its dr development drilling program later this year. While no new lease rounds are expected under the current administration, we have seen movement among the leaseholders. One way to build your portfolio to create economies of scale without new leasing is to farm in to existing licenses. We have seen some exchanges of leaseholders and expect this will continue. As for the U.S. sector of the Gulf of Mexico, this is the region that led the steep rise in day rates last year, breaking the 400,000 mark after starting the year at around half that rate. However, this market has reached a point of fairly balanced supply and demand. There are a couple of drill ships rolling off charter this year that are being marketed internationally and may leave the region if term work does not materialize in the U.S. Gulf. But Stena Icemax has already committed to a job that will bring it to the U.S. Gulf later this year, and sources indicate at least one more drill ship is likely to be added to the fleet, possibly in 2024. For a couple of years, this region also failed to hold these sales. These have now resumed, with the first this year to be held in a couple of weeks on March 29th, and a second will be in September. From here, Matthew will take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Cinnamon. Uh, turning now to Africa and the Mediterranean, and floating rig demand in West Africa is expected to trend upwards over the next year, and a lot of that will be on the back of Shell and Total Energy, recent discoveries and campaigns in the Orange Basin. Those of increased interest in exploration offshore Namibia and South Africa, with many in the industry watching closely in hopes that the Orange Basin could be a new Guyana for the region. There are several further campaigns in this area that could begin in 2024 or 2025. Woodside recently signed an agreement for a potential farm in at PEL 87 off Namibia, while Africa Oil has been in discussions to farm out its interest at Block 3B slash 4B offshore South Africa. And in addition to that, you've got floating rigs remaining active in Angola, Nigeria and Senegal. And in the shorter term, operators have been looking for floating rigs for short term drilling jobs in other parts of West Africa. And that is where we see the uh, rig Tetris come into play with units, uh, operators searching for units to fill in those short jobs between other longer terms. Uh, we recently saw the uh, Valaris DS-12 drill ship secure a new contract in between long term work in Angola and Egypt. Activity in East Africa is small in comparison to West Africa, but the recent fixture for the drill ship Capella in Mozambique indicates that we could see high rates for short term activity in the area. And once again, that's a rig that's moving regions for that particular work and will be returning to Asia for a long term contract following the completion of the work in Mozambique. In the Mediterranean, we've got interest from multiple operators in continued drilling offshore Egypt and Cyprus, plus exploration drilling offshore Lebanon this year, following large natural gas discoveries in the area.
Turning now to the North Sea, which is the home of many of the harsh environment semi-submersibles that we've mentioned previously. Now, floating rig activity in the North Sea has been rather soft in 2023. We're expecting activity in Norway to pick up by late 2024 due to government incentives. But in the UK North Sea, some operators have slowed their activity, citing the government's energy profits levy. And what we've recently seen there is even a uh, semi-submersible have its contract uh, cut short, with the company citing uh, its reallocation of resources to work outside the North Sea uh, in reaction to that uh, EPL. And with that global market tightening, drilling contractors are now anticipating rigs moving out of the North Sea. To see some of those harsh environment semi-submersibles could be well suited for certain jobs elsewhere, including South Africa or Australia, taking advantage of the uh, tight uh, supply and high day rates globally as uh, activity is a little slow in their regular home region. Um, we will see the Oldfield drilling semi-sub Deep Sea Mirror leave the North Sea for a 300-day contract with Total Energy in Namibia later this year. And the only drill ship in the region, the Deep Value Driller, was recently bareboat chartered by Saipem and will be moving to the Côte d'Ivoire to drill later this year also. Moving on to our key takeaways for the uh, webinar today. We've seen increases in seismic campaigns, capex budgets, and EMP earnings, and those are all indicators that floating rig demand will remain strong. The contractors are now in their strongest position since the 2014 downturn, and the very tight floater market means that contractors are making more strategic choices about which jobs to bid on to take advantage of those rising day rates. We should expect to see more regional mobilizations for floating rigs, and we will also see rigs moving back and forth between regions for short term jobs over the next couple of years. That tight offshore rig availability means day rates are trending up globally, and that should be true for both drill ships and semi submersibles going forward. So now places to watch for future floating rig growth include Australia, Brazil, Colombia, India, where ONGC is looking to increase its deep water activity and Namibia with the Orange Basin. Thank you all for attending our webinar today. I'm going to hand it over to Paul now uh, for our Q&A segment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew and Cinema. Uh, a lot of great information there and certainly uh, some key insights to take away from the SGN team. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have received a couple of questions from the audience through the, the chat box, um, and I'll just go through a couple of them if we can hopefully answer them. Um, so the first one is uh, around day rates. Could rising day rates reach a point where demand contracts in response to the raise, raising costs for operators? Paul, cool. um, theoretically possible at some point, but I don't think we're at that level yet. I mean, what you may see is some uh, smaller contractors put off drilling programs. Um, but for you know some some smaller operators put off drilling programs in response to high day rates, but more likely that's in response to the tighter supply. Um, you know day rates are rising now, but uh, it is important to note that they're rising from quite a low point after several years of flat to declining rates. So I, I don't think we're at that point um, where demand would be contracting in response to that. More you might see a movement or reallocation of resources in some cases. We've had a couple on sort of the, the floating supply side. So uh, are we likely to see more consolidations in the floating rig market? I think that's possible. Um, we were, you know, we were already in progress right now. Sea drill is acquiring uh, Aquadrill. Um, be uh, taking back many of those rigs that they previously managed as part of a consolidated fleet. And I think there has been some talk in the market recently of uh, if, this, if some of the smaller contractors are um, well suited to, to compete in the market with a limited number of rigs. So I think it is possible you, see, you may see more consolidation in the market. But we'd already seen several large um, you know, mergers in recent years. Uh, most recently, you know, the Noble Mask one. So we, you know, we may have seen some some companies already take their, their shot at that and more interested in getting their current fleet to work at the moment. Um, 
So many rigs from the last building boom coming up or needing their 10-year SPS. Um, how do we see this affecting availability in the near term? Have we got cinnamon or Matthew for that question? Well, yes. Um, a lot, yes, like I said, mentioned, a lot of rigs are coming up to their 10 year point um, uh, for the surveys now, and that can take longer. And that's going to be part of the, the sort of situation going forward is you're going to fit in. Um, to fit in these survey periods in between jobs and at a time of high day rates like this you know you're going to want companies are going to want to limit how how much they take how long they're taking uh, rigs offline for uh, for those surveys but it is necessary so you know they're going to carve out the time in between it and it will probably affect some start dates of certain contracts okay hey, we've just got one time one question time for the one last question um what do we think will happen to the uh, diamond managed aqua drill rigs uh, once sea drill finishes the aqua drill purchase? Are we any thoughts on that, Seth? I think it's been stated that you know they'll continue to be managed uh, by the, the aqua drill rigs. I think are going to be continued to be managed by the companies uh, currently managing them until the uh, acquisition is closed. So they continue to be marketed and managed until that point. Uh, I think after that, the intention is to have those units all marketed under sea drill. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a few other questions, but I'm conscious we, we're at the end of our allotted time. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending um, today's presentation. For those questions that we didn't have time to cover, uh, we will reach out to you uh, individually and discuss the questions and hopefully answer them over the coming days. Um, I can also confirm, you know, the recording will be posted in by the end of this week. And again, we will reach out to everybody to advise them where you can re-listen to that, um, the webinar. Um, so again, thank you very much for attending. And that concludes uh, today's presentation. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Now.